Hey North Coast, we're so glad that you're here with us today. My name's Lynn, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. If you're looking for sermon notes or more information, you can go online at northcoastchurch.com. We're continuing in the series, Mark, the untold story of Jesus. So grab your Bibles and open it as we jump into the Word of God together. Hope you enjoy. We are starting off with some family news today. First of all, um, many months ago, uh, I welcomed a group from Hillsboro, Ohio, who has been watching us become North Coast Hillsboro. And I mentioned it started with a group of guys in a garage doing a men's Bible study. And the women folks said, hey, we want to get in on this. And now they're in a music studio and they have services on Sunday. And I use the term women folk. I don't know why. Um, so I got a package this week in the mail. Uh, from the women folk of Hillsboro. Um, so uh, we called the bomb squad, SWAT. Uh, is it ticking? Is there wires to it? They wanted me to open it up, and I opened it up, and inside was this incredible t shirt. Um, so uh, I think that's a forgiveness, or we're still okay. So for the women, the incredible, amazing, beautiful and wise, every one of them, women of Hillsboro, Ohio, uh, who are joining with us today, uh, thanks for bringing the men folk with you. And, uh, and thanks for the t-shirt. Uh, so here's what we're doing, a little bit different today. We're going to take about the first eight to ten minutes and get you caught up on stuff that I've been being stopped with publicly. Um, whether the family and I are at the dinner or cruise around North County or wherever, people want to know about, hey, what's going on in Mexico or what's going on with the instrument drive that we just did? Hey, what was the final total on whatever? And I realized we do a great job of saying, hey, guys, here's a need in our community. Would you like to meet it? And the North Coast always goes, yeah, and then we move on to the next one. And sometimes we don't stop and go, hey, look what you did. It was just amazing to see the response from the school district and the superintendent that simply, again, they came to us and said, hey, you're a church with a big mouth that always said, if there's needs, talk to us. So we're going to talk to you. We'd love to put an instrument in the hand of every child in the Vista Unified School District. <laughs> And I was hoping that maybe 100, 200 instruments would show up. And look what you did. It's been absolutely amazing. I'll tell you the cool stories about that, though. Many of you wrote letters and put it in your instrument and just passed it on. Um, letters that Christians are supposed to write. Not letters that say, hey, if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. Here's a flute. And it's like, well. <laughs> no, no. Letters that simply said, uh, this was the age this flute was given to be by my mom. Here's how many years I've been playing it. This is where this flute was able to travel with me, or this is where this instrument was able to go with me. Some of you played that instrument long past school. Some of you were been in bands and symphonies and orchestras. Some of you mentioned the states, the names, the countries that you were able to take that instrument to, and simply said, I hope now you take great care of this instrument. It's yours, and I just want to bless you with it. To, to watch school superintendents and band directors not just be flo blown away by the amount of instruments, but to start going through the papers that some of you put inside it was absolutely amazing. I was stopped a couple times this last week with people saying, what's going on down in Los Barillas? And I always say, fishing, good fishing. <laughs> um, if I ever disappear and you're like, Chris hasn't shown up in weeks, don't even ask where I'm at. I'm down in Los Barillas. Um, about an hour north of Cabo, we have a little community of about 2,500 people. Uh, the English church is using all of our videos. East Cape Christian Fellowship, we give a shout out to them. Um, and then the, uh, the Spanish-speaking church there is using all of our videos and teaching from our Spanish venue next door here on the Vista campus. And uh, it was uh, last spring, we just put buckets in the door and said they're trying to build a church. There's no way that community can come up with the funds. Those of you that are willing to help, can you help? And you raised over half the money for their entire church and building. This is a clip of when we were down there in the fall because we had to check out the church and do a lot of fishing. And, uh, <laughs> and I've shown you, I think, this clip. Um, but uh, we got some videos this week. You're going to see this little, uh, 
this little Mexican building uh, that they used to meet in that was a church. And you're going to see behind it one of the largest buildings between Cabo and La Paz right now. And it is a huge white infrastructure. And the meeting space is almost done. And I was told in the next two or three weeks they'd be able to move both congregations inside that building. It looks like this. Well, hey, North Coast, Chris here. We are down in Los Barillas, down in the tip toward Baja, Mexico. I am standing in the exact church that you guys have helped build for this community down here. We've got our Captain Chewy, who for seven years has been doing a Spanish venue down here, using all the North Coast teaching from our Spanish venue. He's ministering now to about 25 families. They're doing some incredible work, great children's ministry. The English church is down here as well, and those two are combining to have Spanish and English services, English using our videos as well, and and this is the building, this is what's going on. This could have never been put up without your help. On top of this, behind me, there's a little foyer, there's restrooms, there's another children's classroom on the other side, and you are greatly changing this little city of Los Barillas and the ministry because of your generosity. Way to go, North Coast. Wasn't that a cool update on that building back there? When you see the little building they're meeting in and then the one that's going up beyond, and I can't wait until you guys send me down there again to, uh, do a lot of fishing and check a little bit on the church. It would be awesome. Uh, okay, last piece of footage is happening right now in our new campus that is about to open in Rancho Bernardo. And uh, they have been, in the last few weeks, uh, just doing all they could for about a 30-year auditorium um, that the school district said, if you want to make it into church, it, it can be your church. And so the bathrooms need to be redone. The walls need to be redone. Uh, even this weekend, on Saturday morning, there was a group of about 50 or 60 volunteers that met for an unboxing and an assembly uh, meeting. And I'm like, an assembly meeting? And they're like, it's not what you think. We're assembling everything that we need to try to turn classrooms into a church. All those little four-by panels um, that keep all the kids corralled inside an algebra classroom and makes it colorful and actually like a children's ministry, um, whether it's rocking chairs or plastic slides, whether it's cribs, um, the stuff that needed for the auditorium. And they had an unboxing and assembling going on this weekend. And it looks like on the 31st and just three weeks away, we'll be able to have our first services at Rancho Bernardo. But take a peek inside of the changes going on. That, that last picture was our preview service we had a couple months ago. We said, hey, those are interested, just come, and we'll have a little Q&A and a time of worship. And they almost filled the whole thing in just a preview service. So cool what is happening down there. So here's the problem. When I wanted to give you an update on stuff that's going on, my mind immediately goes, uh-oh, who are you going to miss? There's going to be people going, why don't you mention what we're doing? Well, how come no one showed up to it? Do you realize that now, North Coast, you're doing over four service projects a day? Four service projects a day in the communities around North County. It's what we ask every life group to be a part of. It's why every life group gets involved in those projects. And because of that multiplication effect, four a day are happening. And so I just wanted to run through a list of not just locally what is happening, but internationally what is happening. Hold your applause. This is going to be quick. I'm going to botch some names. I'm going to leave some people out. I apologize ahead of time. Greg and Julia Jones in the Solomon Islands. Casey and Christy Yorman in the Czech Republic. Jay and Deborah Evans with Outside the Bowl in Africa, Haiti, and Mexico. Christy Owen in the Ukraine. We are sending two of our student ministry uh, school uh, students out there this summer to work with her in the Ukraine. Greg and Helena Savoka in Serbia. Dave and Lily Chrisman in Crew Campus Crusade for Christ. There are two couples I cannot name. They are part of the multiplication ministries. They're doing underground house churches in China. And because of that, we will leave them nameless, but you know who you are. And those of you that support them know who they are. Shane and Laura Sebastian with Campus Crusade for Christ. Carlos Salas, Salas with uh, Reaching the Hungry. Sam Naylor in Russia running the huge orphanage and school out there. In India, Fabrik just had a trip that got back this week working with the lowest of the low, those that are considered subhuman in the caste system to bring them value and hope to rescue them from sex trafficking and to feed them and most of all give them the name of Jesus and value and that they are loved. 
the Skarnas with YWAM in Haiti, Nikki Cloys with Operation Mobilization, Deborah Ryan and Al Ellis with El Camino Ministries in Peru, feeding and Bible school for the kids, Tom and Lily Card running a dream center down in San Catin in Mexico, Rod and Tina Struxman in Rancho Santa Marta, a Mexico school abandoned for, for, for abandoned and forgotten kids, Mike Stock working with kids around the world, Andy Vano with Pump It Up bringing fresh water around the world, Quentin Hufford with Every Generation Ministries, Children Curriculum in Africa. Mark Palm running Samaritan Aviation in New Guinea, flying missionaries and desperate need in and out of small landing strips. Terry and Diane Williams, medical missionaries out of Carlsbad. You have built three churches in Ecuador in the last three years. One in Los Barillas that your fingerprints are on that you've just seen. Church planning, you've done over 250 church plants the last four years in Vietnam and Malaysia. Um, Compassion International, you're giving over $1.5 million annually to to help some of the most needy and impoverished kids, not just with food and medical supplies and education, but the hope of Jesus. Kevin Boyer, working with National Network of Youth Workers. Kyle and Wendy Menig with the 210 Group. Stephen Yumi Barrett with DCPI, Dynamic Church Planning International, which we partnered with to do all this church planning overseas. An organization of men and women that go in and find those that know God and would love to work, would love to serve, but they have no training, no Bible studies like this in their countries. And they go in and find leaders and teach and equip and raise church planners. The Carpenters with Pioneer USA, Joyce Boussier, I know I said that wrong, with EFCA, Reach Global, South Asian Friendship Center. Alan Schleeman with Stand to Reason doing apologetics, love that guy. Paul and Kathy Becker with DCPI. Paul Savona and Annette Nelson, who here try to keep all this going and link ministries and people involved with ministries together. Thank you so much. I know I've forgotten some. I am so sorry. And yet our military ministry to those of you, some 900 military families, because we're so close to Camp Pendleton that are part of North Coast, and just love ministering to you and your family and how all of you serve, and yet how you take the ministry out of here on your deployments to a place where now we are one of the church services being broadcast in video over AFN, the Armed Forces Network, on a weekly basis to all of our men and women stationed overseas. This is just the list that I came up with this week, and I know I'm gonna get a flood of, what about, what about, what about, what about? It is amazing. Nationally, North County, and internationally, what your fingerprints are on. And the question has to come back, why? Why? Why do you give millions? Why do you give time? Why do you give money away at the door? If you've got a venue or a campus, why do we care about Rancho Bernardo? <laughs> Why do we care about those overseas? What has happened in the heart of humanity that has turned what I am naturally selfish and is mine and what I work for to be generous? We hit a passage today that defines it. This is Christianity. It's the first time through our study through the book of Mark. As we've been looking at the life and teachings of this guy, Jesus, and we've been pulling the scraps off the wall, off the pages of what he said and who he's been with and where he's been, as we've been trying to figure out, is this man, myth, or Messiah, we come finally in chapter 3 where he leaves the crowd, and chapter 4 he comes to a place where he decides to sit down, or in chapter 3, and say, this is what you're being called to do. So today, if there's a question in your mind about what does it really mean to be a Christian, if you're just checking it out, or if you're a follower of Christ wondering, okay, what's, what's my job position and title? What do I do? We've spent 13 minutes on looking at what we've done. Now let's look at simply why. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. If you have a Bible and you haven't been with us for a while, we're in Mark. If you've been with us for a while, your Bible just falls open to Mark at this point. Um, we've been here three months, and we're in chapter 3. We're a relatively slow church. That's okay. We love it. And we're in verse 7. Back of the Bible, look for the guy's names. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Mark chapter 3. Or take out your smartphone. Verse 7. So Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake. Now why? You, you start a sentence that basically says Jesus ran away with the boys. Why? What's he scared of? What's he running from? We got to back up to where we left off. Verse 5. Jesus looked around them with anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Time to run away. But I'm bummed. 
This is the first time Jesus can pick a fight. If you weren't here last week, just to cut it short, Jesus had a chance to heal a man, a crippled man, but it was on the Sabbath day, on their holy day. God said it's a day of rest. They have manufactured that into hundreds of reasons why you can't work or can't do anything. And God said, no, no, I want a time of rest and relationship. Don't go to your job. Go to your family. This is good for you, your walk with God, your wife, your kids, your husband, even your singleness. You need a pause button. Otherwise, you'll have a tendency to work seven days a week. You need a time of built-in rest. But man-made law said, well, you can't walk this far. You can't lift this up. You can't tie a knot. You can't do, you can't do, you can't do. And Jesus says, really? On a holy day, you think it's wrong to heal a man? Is there any other time that's better than on a Sabbath day to heal a person? So he healed the man just to show him. You're putting rules ahead of people, and people are supposed to be ahead of rules. Well, now the religious leaders have finally found a good reason to try to kill him, and Jesus withdrew. Oh, there's a little West Texas side of me that says, mm, I want you to look at the boys and go, saddle up, lock and load, let's ride. Do, 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 do. Wah, wah, wah. Little Pueblo town, Jesus and the boys come riding in, bandanas pulled up tight, and you're like, mm, Katie bar the door, it's go time. And Jesus goes, what, they want to kill me? Run away, run away. And I'm like, no. Tell them, right into their headquarters. Seriously, you're plotting to kill me? Why? Because I'm loving people? Because I'm doing good? Because I'm healing people? Because I'm teaching the love of God? Because I can forgive sins? Seriously, that's what you're about? And then do something with your fingers that causes them to melt? That would be one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. In the Bible. P.S., how dare you ever criticize Jesus? And I'm like, that's a tattoo worthy, right? Like, hey, don't don't use his name wrong. Remember the chapter where he melted people? That's good. (laughs) Not Jesus. Well, you guys want to kill me? Let's get out of Dodge. And he gets to 12, and they ride out of town. And we'll watch the strategy of this throughout this chapter. A large crowd from Galilee followed, and when they heard all that he was doing, circle, highlight, underline, doing, thank you, t-shirt, Hillsboro. when they heard all that he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions around the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. And because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Now whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. And he withdrew from the cities and he goes out to the lonely regions around the lake, but the crowds have heard what he is doing. No one is talking yet about what he is teaching. They all know what he is doing. And the crowds all come because they want him to be doing something for them. It's it's bad English. It's good theology. They want Jesus to be doing something for them. And they all come so much that they're going to push around him knowing this. He tells his disciples, find a boat somewhere on the shore. Find someone that's not using one. Get it ready. I'm going to push off from shore. Why? Because he wants to get rid of the people? No. Once again, he wants to teach. We've been seeing this over and over. And I can't teach if everyone's pushing and shoving, everyone's touching, everyone's carrying their illness, their loved ones, their brokenness. And once again, we find a crowd that gets caught up in the spectacular, but not the spiritual. We have a crowd that gets caught up in everything Jesus can do for them. But no one in this scene wants to be there for what he can teach them. Maybe I harp on this so much, North Coast, because it's it's a button of mine for Chris. How much do I come to God for what I want him to do for me versus how much do I come and just go teach me? Man, teach me. How do I become a better husband? How do I become a better dad? How do I keep a tighter rein on my mouth and, and my spiritual gift of sarcasm? How do I become a better leader? It's, it's in the Bible somewhere. I haven't found it yet, but it's in the book. It's in the Hebrew. How do I, how do, I do this better? 
And we find once again the crowds get in the way of Jesus' agenda. Now it says he does heal people, but it doesn't say who or what or how. It doesn't want to take us into the spectacular. It doesn't want to take us into the miracles. It's the compassion of this God that will heal people. But his agenda is to change us spiritually, internally. Everybody he heals will die. And he doesn't seem to care much about the temporary when the eternal is at stake. I will heal you, but what, you got another 10, 15 years to live? What then, buddy? Oh, I'll I'll heal you, young one, but what do you have, another 50, 60 years to live? And then, then what? He's bringing eternal life change, and the crowd wants the spectacular, not the spiritual. The demon possessed start screaming out, we know who you are, the Holy One of God, and Jesus' silences them. I don't need your testimony. There's happening throughout the secrecy in the book of Mark where he's telling people, don't tell anyone what I just did, or he's silencing the demoniacs that come to him because he knows this is the result. Everyone is coming because they want God to bless them. And the more the word gets out that God is on earth, they just want me to bless them. I've come to teach them. And sometimes our understanding and definition of God gets in the way of what he wants for us. He wants to teach. He withdraws to a lonely place. He has them have a boat where he can push off from shore and teach. In verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside. And he called to him those that he wanted, and they came to him. Now he appointed 12, designated them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 that he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To him he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. That's a good one. Andrew, Philip... Bartholomew, can, you know, what's your favorite Bartholomew story? That's what I thought. <laughs> Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus. Oh, man, talking about Thaddeus. I love the story where Thaddeus was, he, isn't it amazing? We got a list of the 12 disciples, the apostles. And the vast majority of them, you're like, Didn't he, was there seriously, babe, did this really Thaddeus? Oh, I should bring a Bible. <laughs> Is there really a Thaddeus in there? Friends called him T. Had, but he's in there. No big story about him. T. Had. Why do you even say this out loud? Just keep reading, you're teaching. <laughs> Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Always mentioned last with the little don, 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 don. And when Jesus entered a house, And again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Mary, the siblings that Mary will have with Joseph after Jesus. Have you heard what your son's doing? Yeah, how can you not hear? James, the half-brother at this time, is with Mary at home with the other siblings. The Bible will mention the brothers and sisters that he has. And numerous times in the Gospels, when we have them, they come to try to get Jesus back home. What are you thinking? You're going around telling everybody you're God? The crowds are pushing in so tightly. You can't even eat. This is ridiculous. And he gives no answer to them. We'll come back to that. What I really just want to camp on today is this definition of disciple. He called them to be apostles. But, but then in, in Matthew 28, at the end of this, he'll tell them, go into all nations, baptizing people, teaching them everything that I taught you. It's a teaching ministry. Go make disciples of all nations. What does it mean to be a disciple, a mathetes, a follower And this is all they're given. You would think there'd be several pages of instructions on this one. Do you ever open up something from Ikea that you thought would look great in your little girl's room? And you started going through the instructions, and you're like, babe, just take it back. This ain't going to work. How much to already buy it assembled? Done. 
the lengthy instructions we have on simple household objects, how many pages of instructions do you get if you want to be a follower of God, if you're going to be a disciple? Two sentences. He said, this is your job description. And this is what we camp on today. Look at this. Verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designated them to be apostles, that they may be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. That, that's it. What's a disciple? Number one, in your note sheet. I know, we're finally getting to it. And there's three Ps. We don't usually start things with the same letters. It came out of sermon prep this week, so I kept it. It's about presence, simply to be with Jesus. Simply to be with Jesus. And really, that's what we really want to start. The preaching, they're not going to do immediately. The power, they're not going to do immediately. Right now, it's like, look, he designated 12 that they might be with him. That's number one. And that's it. What's the job of a follower? What's the job of a Christian, a Christian, one who is going to be with Christ? Everything that comes from the rest of the job description is going to come out of that relationship. And if that relationship isn't first and foremost, then I promise you the preaching and power isn't really going to happen. It's, it's why that, that, I don't know, that old saying, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's been used so much we roll our eyes at it, and yet it, it's never been more true. This isn't. In this passage before, Jesus was walking around telling people, you can't put new wine into old wineskin. It's going to bust it at the seams. See, the religious leaders are frustrated with who Jesus is hanging out with, how he's not fasting, how he's not washing his hands, how he's not following man-made rules. And he goes, look, you can't put new wine in old wineskin, an old wineskin, that animal flesh that was all sewed up and tied up that you would put your grape juice in and your crushed vines in, and then you would hang it in a cool cellar. And that fermentation process would happen. And that bubbling fermentation process took pretty good grape juice and made it dang good wine. But what would happen, that animal skin, that leather then would stretch. So you have a skins hanging of grape juice. And every couple of weeks you keep looking in or maybe months. And when they start getting, you're like, oh, yeah, work on it, baby. Work on it. And at the end, you have this wine skin that stretched out because of the fermentation and you pour it out to your guest and they're like, mmm, bien vino. This is good stuff. That's Greek. This is good stuff. Now here's what everyone knows. You go, man, I got to make another batch. So you go get more grape juice and you fill the same wine skin and you hang it up. You can't. That wine skin has already gone through the stretching process. Now if you fill that wine skin... The moment the fermentation process happens, that skin can't, it's just gonna, psh, grape juice all over the floor. No one's drinking that stuff. Yeah, you don't get it. He goes, okay. Oh, here's another one. You can't sew a new patch on an old shirt. I'll be here all week, everybody. <laughs> and these first century terms I read and go, all right, he's into like microbrewing and sewing. A couple hobbies of Jesus, never knew that, don't quite know where they fed. So if, if he got the brewmasters in the crowd a little bit with the fermentation process, now he got the women folk. There you go, send another shirt, here we go. Now they got the women folk on this one. And they're like, oh, of course you don't. And the guys are like, what do you mean? Well, honey, it's simple. If you have a new patch and you put it on the old shirt, that old shirt has already shrunk, it's already stretched, but the new patch hasn't. So you put a new patch on your old shirt and we watch it, and that patch is going to shrink, but because the other material's already gone through, it's, that last, it's just going to rip it apart at the seams. Oh, it's kind of the same thing you said about wine, huh? Mm-hmm. What's it mean? I don't, maybe we're doing stuff at home wrong. I don't know. <laughs> it's Jesus standing in the midst of all religious leadership saying, I will not fit your box. I am not going to be a patch for your life. I will not. I will blow it apart at the seams. Your flesh cannot handle this. I'm not going to fit religion. This isn't a philosophy. This isn't an ideology. This isn't a book of all the do's and don'ts. And somewhere there's a curve on how many of us get it mostly right and we get to heaven and how many don't. He goes, it's ridiculous. That's religion. 
you can't put me in religion. I'm going to bust it apart the scenes. I'm new wine. You can't pour me into a religious skin. It's going to burst all over. This is a relationship with God. You cannot earn it. You cannot deserve it. You'll never live up to it. And guess what? You will never be a good enough Christian to get to heaven. That's the best news ever. It's gift. It's grace. It's mercy. And because of that, you get to hang out with him. He goes, this is what it's about. Pick 12. Now, here's the job of a disciple. I expected chapters of how we live life, about conduct, about character, about our speech, about relationships, about what movies we can get to and what we can't get to, about do we really drive 55 it's a 55? Is that a sin or is that just a suggestion? I don't know all this stuff. <laughs> it's not pages. It's three things. Number one, here's your job. You're going to be with me. By the way, there's two more things, but it all comes out of you just being with me. Have you ever been with someone who's just really good? Really good. And the more you are with them, the more you're just better. <laughs> Do you ever have a mentor? Do you ever have somebody that you got to work with that they were just good? And the more you hung around, the more you picked up. Imagine being with someone that is great. Not just great, but the greatest. No, not just greatest, but God. He goes, that's, that's going to change. Oh, man, I still remember seeing her walk across the Azusa Pacific campus, always with this little sundresses, little sandals that match, little something in this long flowing hair, dark Jewish skin, jasmine-like, and not color, but princess, mm-hmm, eyes, ah, thinking, how do I walk next to her? Me and my buddy sat way in the back at this Christian university in a mandatory chapel. Her and her roommate sat way up front. And I'm like, mm, we're from the wrong side of the track, boys. But trying to catch her eye. And for some weird reason, God gave her temporary blindness. <laughs> for a period right now going on 27 years of catching my eye and me catching hers. I'm a 23-year-old freshman after two years at Palomar. That's all you need to know about my education. <laughs> she is a 21-year-old senior. And her friends cannot believe she is starting to walk with the obnoxious old freshman who screams like an idiot at basketball games with half of a helmet on his head with an antenna coming out of it. <laughs> it was a God thing. And the more I just hung out with her and started to drop all this facade of who I am and the life of the party, but just me. And the more she knew me, she liked that me, not the me I pretended to be. And the more things people had been telling me my entire life that I wouldn't pay attention to. She just had to whisper once, and I'm like, I'll knock it off. You realize that most of your jokes when you say, like half the people you joke about, they cry afterwards, and I'm like, ah, they got to put on their big boy pants. She's like, why don't you knock it off? Knocking it off, done. What else? <laughs> what else? <laughs> what else? This is disciples, yeah. My, my love for her wasn't as much of the attraction. I couldn't believe how much she loved me. And the more her actions daily started to show that love for me, it made me just go, I want to be better. I'm not working for her love. It's already there. I just want to, for her, I should be better. I just should be better. It's, it's 1 John 4 that we don't love God. It's God that loves us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that God first loved us and gave his son for us. I grew up in a church that told me my whole life, this book tells me how to love God. It is so hard for me to love someone tangibly, let alone an invisible God. No one ever said, no, 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 Chris, you got it backwards. Just start hanging out with Jesus. And I promise you, when you start realizing how much he loves you, what he's done for you, that he'll never take his hands, his eyes off of you there will start to be a response, buddy. And you will find in living out that response that it's, it's, it's loving God, and it is not something you have mustered up. 
It is a response to being with a God that loves you. This is the call of Christianity. It's not pages. I need you guys to be with me. I wrote there in your note sheet right above it. Oh, I didn't. Oh, it's right under there. Acts 4, 13. Acts 4, 13. It's simply the disciples that are walking around Jerusalem after Jesus died and rose again. And it said people realize that they're unschooled, uneducated fishermen, but they marveled at what has happened with these fishermen after three years. The crowd marveled at these unschooled, uneducated, untrained fishermen and took note that they had been with Jesus. Isn't that cool? What happened to your life? I love going back home and bumping into old classmates. Brown, oh my gosh, I have so many stories. I haven't thought of you in years. Oh my gosh, what are you doing? Actually, I'm a pastor. Oh, <laughs> oh man, you're funny as blank. You've always been so effing funny. That's hilarious. Oh, really, what do you do? Oh, that guy teaches at a church. Oh, God, everybody. Oh. No, seriously, what are you doing? I'm like, we're done with this conversation. I don't know. What, I don't know. <laughs> Sir, what happened to you? I met a guy. <laughs> I met a God changed and just rocked me. This is Christianity, Christianity, that we just practice the presence. How are we with Jesus? It's why we talk so much on just being in the word. It's why we talk so much on every once in a while I got to turn my 80s music off and I just listen. We live in a day and age where we can drop a podcast on anybody. A day and an age where we can get the word of God into our lives in a million ways. And it's just that time of soaking in, wow, this is God. I'll listen to Christian radio. It's hard because I always critique teaching pastors. I critique the teacher. Why'd you do that? That's an illustration. That's not even true. I don't think that verse even applies. And I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up. Just listen. Just listen to the Bible. Pick something out of this that God is doing and who he is. Even if you've heard it a thousand times, just to hold on to. And uh, underneath there, I put 1 Samuel chapter 4. Oh, I didn't. Right next to presence to be with Jesus, 1 Samuel chapter 4, is this incredible story about a kid, Samuel. His mom prays and prays and prays that they may have children. God finally gives him a son. And when he is young, she takes him to the temple. And she says, I'm, I'm dedicating him to the Lord, but I'm leaving him at the temple. He will live here. I will come and visit, but he will work with the high priest of Israel where the tabernacle, the ark of God is, the gold box. That's where Samuel lives. Every day he's a part of the sacrificial system. He's, a, he's an intern. And what's the epicenter of all things Yahweh, God, at that time? And in 1 Samuel 4, there's a story about God whispering his name, Samuel, Samuel. And he keeps running to the high priest at night. Are you calling me? He's like, I'm not calling you. And this, this simple verse that simply said, For Samuel did not yet know the Lord, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. It's one of the most terrifying verses in the Bible. You can live at the temple. You can daily work with the high priest. You can be involved with the most religious activities every day of your life and not know the presence of God. It's religion. And Jesus says, don't pour me into religion. I'll bust it at the seams. Don't put me as a patch on your religiosity. I promise you, it'll tear it apart. This is a relationship that I want you to walk with and know. He says, secondly, in that, then you're going to preach. Simply, you're going to pass on what you've learned from Jesus. You're going to pass on what you've learned from Jesus. I don't even want to hit that today because we'll be talking about that as the chapters go on. He'll send them out and we'll see what the disciples do. For now, they got to do step one. So they're not about preaching yet. Suffice it to say, though, suffice it to say, that's pretty good for me. I like that. Suffice it to say, it wasn't about setting up a box on the corner with big signs and yelling at traffic as they went by. It wasn't about having a platform like this with all of our campuses and venues that are watching today. It's simply passing on what you have learned from being with Jesus. Sometimes preaching, sharing is, is talking to another mom about raising a kid and what you found because of the truth of Christianity. Sometimes it's just talking to a friend about what they need to do in marriage because of what God has done in your marriage. It's simply passing on. Man, this is how my life has changed. I'm, I got to share that. 
I don't share religion. Everyone has their own religion. Worship what you want. Go with you. I'm not going to share religion. I got to share life change. I, I got to share what makes me the husband I am, the dad that I am, the, the employer, the employee that I am. I got to share that. But that only comes when step one is happening. See, and then step three is there's going to be power. The life of Jesus that frees us and frees others. Power. It's the life of Jesus that frees us and frees others. Again, I'll read it. It's real short. He goes up to the mountain. He called to those he wanted. They came to him. He appointed 12, designated them to be apostles, that they may be with him, his presence, that he might send them out to preach. There's the preaching. And that they would have authority, power, to drive out demons. We've seen this power in chapter 3 already when a paralyzed man is lowered in front of him. What's easier to say? Pick up your mat and walk or your sins are forgiven? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. And he says your sins are forgiven. What's harder is to make a paralyzed man walk. Just so you know that I have the power to forgive sins, pick up your mat and walk. And at the beginning of not chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 2, Jesus shows what his power is about. My power is going to be to set you free. My power is going to be able to set you free against demonic oppression. There is a, a spiritual world that's going on. I think Satan works a whole lot different in our culture than he does in a lot of places in Africa and South America today, in Haiti today. Cultures that are very open and sensitive to the spiritual, to the voodoo, to the taboo, to a spirit world. Here it's, it's mainly entertainment driven, those things are. Today, mainly in our culture, he works because he knows things are simply a click away. That, that's how he can get our marriage. Oh, don't get me wrong. We still live in a spiritual world. We still live in a world where we've come in so much contact with the spiritual, the demonic. And he goes, let me tell you about my power. It's to set people free. Hang out with me, Chris. I'm going to change your life. Don't worry about trying to love me. Just hang out with me. Know how much I love you and experience that. Understand grace and mercy. And if you truly come to gifts with grace and mercy, in other words, what I should be destined for, that me and my wife and my three kids should go to hell, and instead, he'll pay the price for anything any of us has done, and all we have to do is accept that and walk. That's grace and mercy. When you truly come to understanding that, and understanding who I am and why I've done it, because I created you, I knit you together in your mother's womb, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That with that, you also have a purpose in life, significance. I promise there'll be a response. That response, you're going to find it's, it's loving this God. Then you're going to have something to share with others. You're going to have something to preach. You're going to have something to, to put on others. And here's what it's about. It's about freeing people from where they were, from where their marriage is at, from where their heart was, from where their ego, from their materialism, from their possessions. He said, this is, this is what I'm calling you to do. This is what I'm calling you to do. And every time we said there's buckets at the door, if you want to help, buckets get filled. We have so many people driving up from down south that there is no parking and no seats at the San Marcos Escondido campus. There is no more parking and seats Sunday morning at this campus, at the Farbrook campus, at the Carlsbad campus. East Cape Christian has a lot of seats and some parking. Send me down there again. <laughs> and so we say, hey, can you help build a church for people that are driving up? There's something happening here they want to be a part of. And, and over and over again, it's your generosity of saying, I want to be a part of setting people free. I want to be a part of that. It's amazing to be a part of you that get that. Who can be a disciple? Easy. Those that are called by Jesus and those who come to Jesus. Those are disciples. Those who are called by Jesus and those who come to Jesus. Well, does Jesus have to call you or can you come to him? I think so. <laughs> Jesus went up on a mountain and he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. Can you come to Jesus if he doesn't call you? I don't think so. I think if you come to Jesus because he's calling you. What if you don't come? Well, then you're probably not a disciple. What if he's not calling me? Well, just the fact that you're asking the question, I think he's calling you. I don't know if the chicken or the egg or the egg and the chicken. It's the whole farm. Just jump in the ranch. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Just open the gate and step in. Did he call you? Did you come? I'm going to go, yes. Congratulations. You, you respond to it. 
And yet you look at yourself and go, oh, man, but you don't understand what I have to get cleaned up right now. You don't understand even right now. I'm coming to church and I'm half-baked. You don't understand what's going on in my life right now. You don't understand what's happening back at home right now. Then I go, you don't understand discipleship. In fact, write it down this way. A disciple was not picked because of who they were, but because of who God could make them be. A disciple was not picked because of who they were, but because of who God could make them be. It's not about who you are. In fact, I put verses there. We don't have time to look through. God goes, oh, I delight in taking the foolish things of the world and making them wise. I delight in using the Chris's of the world. So all of his friends and family just scratch their heads and go, I don't get it. I go, oh, oh, God. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. That's all there is. It's not about where you are today. It's where God wants to take you. And we have so many reasons and excuses why it doesn't apply to us. And I go, then you don't understand following he, he picked a, two guys he named Sons of Thunder. Is that a little curious? Is there an anger issue in the home? Do they have a couple pop-offs in this group that he calls them Sons of Thunder? Like these guys are running, what, they want to kill you? Let's go, let's go. And he's like, come on, guys, to the lake, to the lake. <laughs> Sons of Thunder here, man. These guys just want to brawl. I love that. He picks Peter. End of story. He has to call Peter Satan in the book. Get behind me, Satan. He's like, oh, that's going to stick. Dang it. That's going to go. That's a good one. He picks Simon the Zealot. This guy is a sworn revolutionary. To defend the nation of Israel at all costs against all Roman oppression. And then he picks a guy named Matthew, who's a collaborator with the Roman government. And accepts and takes taxes on behalf of them. And he makes them bunk together. This is amazing. There's guys in there we don't really know much about. And maybe that's good. Maybe we only follow the stories of a few from this point on because the rest he doesn't want to leave to be so magnificent we look at ourselves and go, I can't do it. He goes, look, they're just names. It's not about who they were. It's about who I'm going to make them to be. Man, I picked 12. It's a different group of 12. I want three smooth-talking guys. Three guys with woo. W-O, winning others over. Three guys that are just like good on stage. Three guys that are slick with words. I want two like theological PhDs that can always fact check everything, make sure we're doing things right. They can write the messages. My other guys deliver it. I need two money guys and they're gonna like support the whole ministry. And you need two because if anything happens to one, you're like, "Mm." (laughs) two money guys that just support the whole thing. What do we got? Three, four, five, six, seven, five, five. The five left are like MMA fighters, like cage match dudes. They're good in brawling. And they just go in front and around us everywhere we go. I'm like, that's the perfect 12. And him, he's all, no. I'm picking guys that are diabolically opposed to each other. I'm going to pick guys that don't get along. And I'm going to pick guys who don't get me. Oh, and by the way, Judas, yeah, you're in. (laughs) What? The guy with the pointy nose and the ears and the tail that comes out from under his robe. Yeah. (laughs) Judas, you're in. Because there's no human being that can stop the plan of God. You're in. What do you expect? Expect criticism, but avoid conflict. Expect the criticism, but avoid the conflict. In fact, if we aren't being criticized, we might not be doing what we're called to do. He's criticized, and he avoids the conflict. His family comes and says, we think he's crazy, he's out of his mind, and he doesn't say anything. He avoids the conflict. He lets his life speak for himself. Crazy? You think I'm out of my mind? He is out of his mind. Family direct quote. Really? I knew the crowd was going to be pressing around me, so I had a boat waiting for me just to push off from shore. I just set up 12 as an entire leadership structure and system about what we're going to do, and I set up my teaching and training My entire ministry is about being other-centered. I'm not easily provoked when people want to kill me. You think I'm out of my mind? He's got the most strategic leadership style and character and personality. But people don't understand him because he's not being very religious. He's just incredibly relational as a God. And he wants to change people. So expect to live a life that doesn't fuel the opposition. Expect to live a life that doesn't fuel the opposition. I have never had a conversation with a Christian that met me after one of the services and said, people at work hate me. Why? 
because I'm the most loving, humble servant. I put everyone first. And my job is just to lift them up. So what's really going on? He walks away from the conflict and the opposition. That, that doesn't help the cause. It doesn't help what I'm called to do. Oh, there will be a time when they come after a woman caught in adultery, he will stand in front of all the rocks and say, not on my watch. Oh, he will stand for others, not himself. And he's all, this is the job description. Congratulations, you go into the entire world and make disciples, followers of all nations. Congratulations, this is your job description. Wow, what a story. This is what you're invited to. And it should change you dramatically to a point in time where you're going to want to share. That's Christianity. Father, may we be a people that continually come back to a calling of just practicing your presence, not an hour and a half on the weekend, but God, how daily are we walking with you, keeping in mind you cannot, will not take your hands, your eyes off of us. How are we daily finding place to read or listen or get your word into our life? How are we daily, God, just coming back to understanding how you see us so that we can learn how to see ourselves, so that we can learn how to love others? May you continue to move all of us, wherever we are on that journey, closer to you, to be more like you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, we'd love to connect with you online. You can send any questions, comments, or prayer requests to info at northcoastchurch.com. We also want to thank you for your continued generous support. If you'd like to give, you can donate online through our website or the North Coast app. We hope you were challenged and encouraged this week through the message. We'll see you next time.